Um, we have been on a series called Fact Check. And Thursday, as I began to prepare and make preparations, and as I do, and uh, began to turn my thinking and thought pattern towards what I was going to be studying on, I felt the Lord bring a divine interruption. And I felt like the Lord uh, wanted to get a word across to this church today. So I believe if you're here and you are, uh, that there's something very special for you today. Uh, but the Lord stopped me in my tracks. He said, I want you to go and preach on this. So I want you to turn with me in your Bibles today, Revelations chapter 1. Revelations chapter 1. And we'll read through, uh, we'll start in verse 20, and we'll read down to verse 5. It says this, uh, John, uh, the, the revelator, uh, was on the island of Patmos, uh, banned there before his testimony, uh, his testimony for the Lord Jesus Christ, was there at Patmos, and it was on this deserted island that was uh, that was reserved for criminals, that the Lord appeared to him and gave him the, the revelation, the revelation of Jesus Christ, the, the, the book of Revelation, that he was given this revelation of, 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 of who Jesus is. And he begins to write. And in verse 20, he says, The mystery of the seven stars which you saw in my right hand and the seven golden lampstands, the seven stars are the angels or the messengers of the seven churches, or the pastors, is what he's saying. This is the pastors, the messengers, and the seven lampstands which you saw are the seven churches. So the apostle, or the apostle John begins to write to the seven churches in Asia Minor. He begins to write to these churches, begins to write to, to, to the pastors of these churches, and he begins to address what's going on in their church. In verse 1 of, of chapter 2, the angel of the church of the Ephesus, to the angel or the pastor or the messenger of the church of Ephesus, write, These things says he who holds the seven stars in his hand, who walks in the midst of the seven golden lampstands. I know your works, your labor, your patience. You cannot bear those who are evil. And you have tested those who say they are apostles and are not, and have found them liars. And you have persevered and have patience and have labored for my name's sake and have not become weary. Man, I'm telling you what, he starts going, this is a good church, how about it? He says first, I want to stop here a second. It says, Jesus said, listen, I, I'm, I'm walking. It says he, he, he says he calls himself the one that's walking in the midst of the golden lampstands. He's walking right in the guts of the church. He's, right, he's walking right down every single aisle. That word middle or miss, it means he was right in the middle of the church. There's an unseen realm church you cannot see. But I tell you what, Jesus is real, Holy Spirit is real, and he's walking amongst us when we are together. He's in the midst of this thing. He walks in the midst of it. He says, I know your works. The word know there in the Greek, it means I see them. Do you know that God takes note of everything that you do? Jesus said, I know your works. I see your works. I perceive your works. I understand what you're doing. I see it. I want you to know something this morning that Jesus is intimately aware of what's going on in our church services. He's intimately aware of what's going on in your life. He sees it all. Amen. Great church. He said, man, I know your works. Man, I'm telling you what, this is, a, this is some church. You're patient. You hate evil. You're doing the good stuff. You're doing the right things. I love the way the Lord deals with these people because he always goes and gives the good first before he ever delivers the bad. You know, it's a good way. Listen, if you ever bring correction to somebody or you're, maybe you're in spots, you know what, it's always better to tell them what they're doing right before you go and give them what they're doing wrong. He said, man, I know your works. He goes and lists. We just read it. And then verse 4, he says this. Nevertheless, I have, I have this against you, that you've left your first love. I 
I want you to know something this morning that God is not so much interested in your duty as, your, as he is your heart. I want you to know something this morning that Jesus is much more interested in you falling in love with him than you doing all the stuff. Do you understand that's why you were created? You were created to love God. And see, listen, you were, you were created to fall in love with God. See, you can, you can love something but never fall in love with it. You can love something but never fall. Listen, you can love something. You've got to fall. It's time for us folks to fall in love with Jesus again. Fall in love with Jesus again. My question, I'm not here to beat, I'm not here to beat you up or to spank you. I promise you, I'm here to challenge some folks this morning. I want you, I want you to ask some very hard questions to yourself this morning. Have you left your first love? Have you left the love that you once had for Jesus? Are you on fire today like you were on fire three months ago? Are you on fire today like you was three years ago? Or have you left your first love he said I see what you're doing you're doing the right stuff you're doing the right things he said I see your works I see what you're doing you're a great church but listen all of that's for naught if you're not in love with Jesus it's all for naught if I'm not in love with him if my heart's not right listen we ought to be excited about coming to church we ought to be excited about serving Jesus excited like it's interesting because the first question that Jesus asked Peter after he denied him. It wasn't, well, how much time you spend reading, in, reading the word today, Peter? You know, when you, when you, how much time, you know, that's the service bunch, right? Or that's the devotion bunch. Well, you know what, if you'd spot, spend some more time with Jesus, well, there's probably truth in some things like that when we, when we hear these things. But listen, God wasn't interested, Jesus wasn't interested in addressing the, he was just wanting, I want to get you, Peter, do you love me? Peter, do you love me? He knew, he said, I can get your love back. All the rest of the stuff comes back. Well, if I can get your love back where it needs to be, you know what? Your devotion returns. Your excitement returns. Your passion returns. Your fire returns. Why? Because I'm falling in love with Jesus. Have we left our first love? Hallelujah. You got to look at your face. Look what he says here in verse 5. Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen. Repent and do the first works. Or else I will come to you quickly and remove your lampstand from its place unless you repent. Those are sobering words. What's Jesus saying? He said, if you don't get your love walk right and your love where it needs to be, you're going to lose your influence. You're not going to be a light like you, like you need to be a light. You're going to lose it. You're going to lose your testimony. Why are we on this earth? We're on this earth to reflect Him to the world. It's not for me to drive, have, be, have a bless me club. I'm thankful that I can be blessed. I'm thankful that I believe in blessing. I believe in prosperity. I believe in that. I believe that God wants to do that. But listen, I'm going to tell you at the end of the day, what's this thing about? It's about me reflecting Him to the world. It's about me being conformed to the image of His dear Son. It's about me showing, what the wor showing to the world what love looks like, what mercy looks like. See, Jesus never gives you anything He doesn't want you to become. So He gives you love, that way you become love. He gives you mercy, therefore you become living, breathing mercy mercy God gives you something in order for you to become it to the world that they can see who he is and they can fall in love with him but we got a whole body of people and I'm not saying in this church specifically we got a whole bunch of people that don't love Jesus and that's why the world don't want to love him all right that went over like a lead balloon are you with me here the warning I'm asking you a question this morning have you left your first love Have you left your first love? Look in the Amplified, Revelation, on the screen, on the screen Revelations 2, 4 in the Amplified. Look what it says. I'll have it poured up. But I have this 
one charge to make against you. That you have left abandoned the love that you had at first. You have deserted me, your first love. The Good News Translation says, But this is what I have against you. You do not love me now as you did at first. Remember how excited you were for Jesus? What happened to that? Remember how, how passionate you were? How you love to do what you do? And you're not that way now? Why has that happened? I propose to you today that maybe you have left your first love. Maybe you have left your first love. What kind of love did this church have? What kind of love did they have? Oh man, this church was on fire. Go and read historically about it. This church started out with 12 disciples. 12. Ephesians chapter 19, Apostle Paul came, comes into the region of Ephesus. He preaches the gospel, walks into a city that was, that was hell-bent on worshiping a false god called Diana. The whole place, the whole city was given over to idols. The whole city, and it was perversion. Perversion was rampant. Sexual perversion was rampant. This city was a vile city, a very vile city. And it started out with 12 disciples. Then all of a sudden, those 12 disciples, and Paul began to preach, and those 12 disciples begin to evangelize that, 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 that city. And the Bible said that, 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 that the word of God grew and prevailed. It began to, to, to escalate. That, man, people, you read in Acts 19, it says there was witchcraft everywhere. They had a huge bonfire in the middle of the city, built up a fire. And the Bible says they brought all of their stuff, all of their witchcraft, their fetishes, all of their symbols and emblems and all of their books and all of that. They come confessing. I think it's interesting that word. You read it, the word confess. They come confessing their deeds the word confess there it's ex homologio and it means they proclaimed it out loud I am a sinner and I need Jesus and this is wrong and they go and they burn they had a huge bonfire and burned up all of their stuff four to eight million dollars worth of stuff they burnt in the city square this place was on fire for Jesus the apostle Paul wrote a book to the church of Ephesus, we hear some of the greatest Pauline revelation. We hear the way, the walk, the warfare of the believer in Ephesians. This is a mature church, a mature a church that was growing in their faith. We hear no rebukes from the Apostle Paul in Ephesians chapter 1. Only revelation of who he was, who we are in Christ and the in Christ realities. It's a church that was growing and maturing. Founded somewhere around 55, 56, or, or Christianity came and began to, to flourish around 55, 56 A.D. Apostle John wrote the book of Revelation somewhere around 96 A.D. In 40 years, one generation, this church had declined. They left their first love. Jesus was coming and giving them a warning. Because what happens is you lose your love. See, it never just shows up in a day. They were doing the works. But they were eventually not do the works anymore. But he showed up really quickly and said, listen, you need to make some adjustments here. Make sure that you go and make this adjustment and make this tweak. You're doing the right stuff, but your heart has, has left me. Your heart, you honor me with your lips, but, 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 but your heart is far from me. You're more in love with the world than you are in love with me. I know, it's a hard one. It's okay. First love. What about your first love? Let's think about that. Think about when you and your wife were dating. First love. begin to have an overwhelming desire to please someone to the point of self-sacrifice you'll sacrifice sleep come on you'll spend endless hours on the phone when you don't even like talking on the phone but you'll spend endless hours talking and just hearing each other breathe you get up in the morning 
the first person you're thinking about is your first love. Calling, texting, good morning. With the emojis. Right? First love. First love. You're, you're consumed with this. You cannot think or talk about anything else. and You don't want to be anywhere else except in that person's presence. First love. This church had that. But they had left it. My question to you today, have you left your first love? Have you left it? Have you left it? Have you left this love? I'm going to tell you something today. There's many things trying to break our stride. There's squirrels everywhere. Squirrel. You know what I'm talking about. The dog one up. He's talking, having the conversation. Squirrel. Anybody else feel that way in your life? Come on, does anybody else feel that way in your life? You can't even concentrate for 20 seconds without something else trying to grab your attention. Something is after your gaze. Something is after your gaze. There's squirrels everywhere. And it's there to break your stride. The Apostle Paul said in Galatians chapter 5, he said, you did run well. What did hinder you from obeying the truth? This persuasion cometh not from him that calleth you. For a little leaven leavens the whole lump. The Apostle Paul said, what has hindered you? What's cut in? Well, that, that word hinder means to sharply cut in in order to obstruct you. What has sharply cut in and cut in over to stop your progress? What is try, what's stopping your progress? What's hindering you? What's cut, the enemy's trying to cut in. He's trying to cut in. He's trying to trip you up. He's trying to break your stride. So he doesn't want you to finish your race. I'm just refusing to let anything stop me. I'm going to run my race. I'm going to finish my race. And I'm going to do it. Listen here. I'm going, to, I'm going to do what God's called me to do. And everybody in this room has a call in your life. And let's just get so determined and persuaded in our hearts that we're going to do what God's called us to do. We're going to do it. And we're not going to let the enemy break our stride. He gets, I'm going to, he gets in my way. I'll throat punch him. I'm moving right on. <laughs> he, comes in the, he comes in the sight. We'll, we'll pull the trigger and we move on. I'm not going to let anything stop me. But if you'll leave your love, if your love begins to wane, you'll stop. Go to 1 John with me. 1 John chapter 2. You guys all right? Is anybody else hot in here? Woo! Glory to God. That was a majority. <sighs> let's do something. I don't know what we got to do, but let's just do something. One side. How about one side? Listen, this building is, listen, it's very hard to acclimate. The metal, the metal on it and stuff, once you lose heat, you lose it. So a lot of times you're cold in here, it's because we don't want it to get blue, we want it to get, so, we, want, we, don't want, we don't want it to be blue blazing cold, but we don't want it to be so, we don't want it to be hot. It's hard. So anyway, so if you ever wonder, just bring a jacket with you sometimes, that'll be all right. First John chapter 2. Look what it says in verse 15. Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eye, the pride of life, is not of the Father, but is of the world. Look what the Message Bible says. Don't love the world's ways. Don't love the world's goods. Love of the world squeezes out love for the Father. I love that. It's probably the, that's, that's a great translation right there. The love of the world squeezes out love for the Father. Right? Next verse. Practically everything that goes on in the world, wanting your own way, 
wanting everything for yourself, wanting to appear important, has nothing to do with the Father. It just isolates you from Him. The enemy's trying to isolate you from the Father. He cannot do that legally. He Listen, when you get born again, you get born again. So he cannot do anything about that in a legal sense. But he can do it vitally. He can cut you off from that relationship. He won't be able to truly. You listen, you can be married but never have. You can have a relationship with someone but never be able to draw from that relationship. Never be able to enjoy benefits from that relationship. Never really be able to truly, truly, truly have what you. You can do that. Are you with me here? The word love there in verse 16 is love not the world. It means personal preferential attachment. He said have no preferential attachment to the world. Have no preferential attachment. Where you would prefer the world over this. Where you would prefer these things over Jesus. I want you to know something today. God takes your love. God takes his love very serious. For God so loved the world that he gave his son. He must take it all. He makes, must take it pretty serious. In Revelations 2, what's he addressing? He's taking his love, your love for him very serious. When you're serving back here in the back with these kids. I know your work. But do you love him? I know your works. But are you in love with me? Are you in love with me? Amen. It's very subtle, church. Very subtle. This happens very subtly. uh, Proverbs 14, 14 on the screen. Look what it says. The black slider in what? will be filled with his own ways. But a good man will be satisfied from above. I want you to see something. Where does it start at? Where does a backslidden state start at? You start in your heart. And what happens is you get filled with your own ways. You start living by your own ways. You start living by your own desires. You start becoming selfish in your life and you begin to be offended more than ever you, you begin to go and, and, and you, you get filled there is a way that seems right unto man but the end thereof is destruction we begin to be filled with our own ways which is only going to lead us to destruction what happens a person begins to backslide now, when I'm talking about backslidden states, I'm not talking about you losing your salvation. Please do not understand it because he's, Jesus is addressing a church. He's addressing Christians. I'm not talking about you losing salvation. I'm talking about you regressing and going backwards. When our lives are marked by spiritual regression and not progression, of going backward and not forward, we're in a backslidden state. We distance ourselves more and more from intimate communion with the Lord. We're in a backslidden state. God is always moving forward. We just sang it. We go from what? Glory to glory to glory, right? Jesus said to go into all the world. That's forward motion. The Apostle Paul said in Philippians chapter 3, he said, I forget those things which are behind and I press towards those things which are before. You, are, you and I are made to move forward in God, not backwards. And if we are moving backwards, we are regressing and we're backsliding. And if you'll check up, if you'll check up, if you'll be honest with your life and be honest with yourself enough, you'll see it. I've left my love for Jesus and I started loving other things more than Him. He said, you have left your first love sequential love order he said you've put other things above me he said you've left you're doing the stuff but you're, you're, you, you've, you've put things above me I'm no longer number one 
I'm no longer the one you pray to when, I'm, when the situation's going on. I don't, do, I don't even hear from you anymore. You go and call somebody up on the phone and ask them their opinion. I'm not even the first one. You, you go and post it on Facebook before you ever really even address it with me. Are you with me? First love left. First love. Sequential love. The first one. Seek ye first the what? The kingdom of God. Jesus said this. Love the Lord your God. What is the first and the greatest commandment? The lawyer said in Matthew 22. Come to him and say, what is the greatest commandment? Well, uh, it, what, what is it, Lord? Jesus said, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength. And to love your neighbor as yourself. It's the greatest commandment. Loving God over anything. I'm asking this morning the question. This is from the Lord. He's the one that stopped me. And he come walking into a church today here. And he said, I know your works. I see that you can discern. You hate those and you despise those that are calling themselves apostles and are not. He said, I see your works, your patience. your love. I see what you're doing. He said, but do I have this against you? Have you left your first love? You've left your first love. Have you backslidden in your heart? The first place you'll give up is in your heart. You'll be filled with your own ways. It's called carnality. It's rampant in the church. We have mega churches everywhere and they're full of babies. Because nobody wants to preach truth and tell somebody, enough, love them enough to say something to them in love and preach truth from a pulpit. They'd rather go and have, have the numbers. Well, praise God. Listen, I just believe if you'll preach truth, the numbers will come. I just truly believe that people are tired of some fluff gospel. And it's, I'm, I'm all for love. I'm all for loving people. There's a time that you and I got to sit and li listen to somebody and hear truth from somebody and be challenged in our hearts in order for somebody to have the opportunity to change. Come on, somebody. I'm not against all that. I'm not against, I, man, I want this place to grow. I believe we are. We are growing. And I, I believe that. But I want to I wanna challenge you enough. I want to challenge. Listen, it comes to me before it ever comes to you. Do you not think Thursday that that was a humbling experience in there? Because he wrote first to the pastor. Filled with carnality. What is a carnal Christian? We call them carnal Christians. You know what it is? It's Christians that knowingly and persistently live to please themselves rather than God. People making decisions every single day to please themselves and not the Lord. Making decisions that's completely contrary to the word of God. They are pleasing themselves and not the Lord. It's carnality. It's carnality. Amen. The enemy wants you in a chokehold. I want you to know that. He wants to get you in a, he wants to get you in the chokehold. He wants to choke the life right out of you. Come on. It's that spirit of python. No, 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 no. That's truth. Apostle Paul does with it. It says the spirit of divination. The word divination there is actually the word python. And we get the word python from. And the python comes around you. And it kills you by its squeezing. Restriction. The devil wants you, he wants to choke it out. Let me show you. Mark 4, real quick. Mark 4, just on the screen. Look, look at it. Don't turn there yet. And some seed fell among thorns. Talking about the seed, the word of God. And the thorns grew up and choked it. And it yielded no crop. Now this is Jesus' divine commentary in, that script, in, that, in this passage of scripture about that right there. Go to the next one. Now these are the ones sown among thorns. Talking about the word 
seed being sown among thorns. They are the ones who hear the word. Talking about the heart, the person hearing the word. Amen. And the what? The cares of this world. The deceitfulness of riches. And the desires for what? Other things enter in and what? And it becomes what? The enemy wants to choke out the life of the word of God in your life. And he'll do it with cares, anxieties, the cares of this world, desires for other things, and the deceitfulness of riches. Choking the life of the word of God out of you. The enemy wants you in a choker. Now let me just show you this real quick. What is it? I, I want to move on. What are the symptoms of a first love left? I, I, I want to give you some symptoms today. I'm talking about the heart. Let, let's look at some symptoms of a heart attack. Let, let's look at the symptoms of a lack of oxygen flowing into the vessels of your heart. Blockages. When blockages come, it begins to block off the, the oxygen to the heart. If you don't fix that, right, it leads to death. The first thing is this. This is what happens when a person begins to lose their first love. There's a lack of interest. Apathy starts to set in. Apathy starts to set in. It's not that you're doing anything wrong. It's just you're doing very little right to get yourself and to keep yourself moving forward. See, a marriage that's failing usually isn't because someone is doing something anything blatantly wrong. They just stop taking interest in doing the things that are right. They stop taking interest in the things that, that they know they once were doing and no longer doing. So it's not that even you're not doing anything blatantly wrong. You're just doing very little right to keep yourself moving forward. You, you're just doing very little right in order to salvage it, in order to bring it back and rekindle passion and rekindle first love. Amen. When, when, when my love for someone is not what it should be, my interest in what he or she says is not what it should be. So you stop seeing value. You stop seeing value. You, and, and you stop seeing value to things with the Lord. I've saw it. I've been almost born again 20 years and saw this time and time again. People come, church, get on fire for Jesus, and the cares of this world start coming. Jesus never promised you a rose garden. Quit making it about that anyway. We go and we go here and sulk and we cry and whine around when it's in the middle of all that stuff that you and I are called to let our light shine. We're making about how somebody's done me wrong, and how this and that and the other. Are you kidding me? Grow up. It's time to grow up. It's not even about that. We wonder why carnality is so like, like it is in the church. It's because nobody, listen, people aren't falling in love with Jesus. Oh, I love God for what he can do for me. I love God because I won't go to hell. Thank God for that. But at the end of the day, it's not, listen, Jesus didn't come. Listen, Jesus didn't come and die so that you just go to heaven. Jesus came and died so he could put heaven on the inside of you. That's why you're alive. Lack of interest. Apathy. You stop growing. You stop putting the time and the effort in. Of what you need to be doing. In order to move yourself forward. Oh, I know your works. He said, but I don't need your works. I need your heart. The next thing starts to happen. That's a scripture. You can, you can write this down. Hebrews 2, 1 through 3. You can write that down about apathy. You see, I got scripture for you. You start neglecting your salvation. You start neglecting it. The second thing that happens, you start having laxity. Allowance of things you once never allowed. Compromise starts to creep in. First, it starts with a lack of interest, a subtle 
lack of interest. Let me say something to you while I've got you here in a second. With marriages, marital drift is normal. It happens. If you don't stay on top of your marriage, your marriage will automatically drift apart. It's, it's, a norm, it's called marital drift. It will happen. If you don't stay on top of your marriage, the drift will happen. And you'll both be going, you'll be going opposite directions. You're married, but you're going in opposite directions. You're not working together, fighting and fussing in your house. It's because you're drifting away. You're, not, you're neglecting your marriage. You're not giving what needs to be given in the marriage. And it, call, it, it will continue to happen that way. So i got to learn... To, to not neglect my marriage and start putting time and energy in my marriage and what begins to happen, I draw closer together. But see, the thing is, it's just like anything else. If you don't, if you don't do something with it, it's going to fall off the map. There's squirrels everywhere. you got kids, you got this, you got that, you got others, you're a, you're, a, you're a moving van. You start out, you drop one off, and you go and pick up the other one. You drop that one off, and you go do this one. We, this is life. And if you don't go and you do what you need to do, you'll find yourself drifting apart. The same thing with our salvation. If you neglect, the Bible says don't neglect your salvation. Don't neglect this so great salvation you got. He just didn't call it salvation, Joe. He called it great salvation. He just didn't call it just being saved. He said you're greatly saved. A lack of interest. And then it leads to this compromise. All of a sudden, you begin to compromise. And all of a sudden, now you start opening the door up for sin in your life. And all of a sudden, you're letting stuff in your house you never once let, you didn't let in your house before. The next thing you know, you're, you're doing things like, you, like, I can't even, you just start, start doing stuff that, that you once never done before. And all of a sudden, you start having friends that you never had. For, you cut those people off 15 years ago. Or you cut those people off five years. And you find yourself looking for their numbers on the phone. And, and you start going, you've got laxity going on. You're, you've left your first love. Then you've got withdrawal. That's the third thing. We get this progression, just a lack of interest, and we get this laxity and compromise that starts to come. And then all of a sudden, we, we start withdrawing. You find yourself not wanting to come to church anymore. You find yourself showing up. Well, instead, of, instead of being here every service like you once were, all of a sudden now, you're not, you're not, you're not, you're not even, you maybe come once a month. And when you do come, it's only when you serve. Can I ask you guys a question in this church? I'm going to pastor you a minute. Why do you only come when you serve? Why, why, there's people in this church that do that. The only time they come to do anything is when they serve. Time out. If that's the only reason you're coming, step down. Because, listen, you've missed, you've missed this thing hugely. I'm helping you. I do, I, don't, don't get mad at me. I'm just trying to help you. I'm trying to stir you up. The enemy's trying to steal things from you. He's trying to kill. He's trying to destroy. And the only time you're getting fed is when, listen, if you're coming here and serving, how can you give something you don't got? Silver and gold have I none, but such as I have, what? Give I thee. Withdrawal starts to happen. You start withdrawing. And you get away from the people that can help you. And then the, third, the fourth thing, what begins to happen is all out rebellion starts to happen in your heart. And you find yourself, op, the lampstand's been removed. Darkness, decrease is happening. Rebellion. Walking in darkness and experiencing the death and destruction of that comes. And you can be saved and going to heaven, and that can happen to you. You say, Well, that never happened to me. Stop. It could happen to you. This church was, this, is, this was a church that was on fire for Jesus. And one generation finds themselves in a place they never thought they could be. So you say, Pastor Paul, how do you return to your first love? Three things, real quick. I'm, I'm, I'm closing this down. Three things. Revelations 2, 4. Please put that up there for me. In the New King James. Three steps. You guys are. Right? I love you guys. I love you. 
Well, well, I feel the love this morning. Praise God. Praise God. Thank you. I'm just trying to help you. I'm just trying to help you. Revelations chapter 2, verse 4. He says, nevertheless, I have this against you, that you've left your first love. Verse 5. What's the first thing he says? What? Remember from where you've fallen. First key to getting back your first love. How do I return back to first love? Number one, you've got to remember. You've got to remember. You've got to be honest. You've got to recognize it. First step is return, in returning is recognizing and being honest with yourself about what's happened. See, I may be preaching today and you might have pain in your heart. And there's a reason for pain. But in this world that we live in, we like to numb it. But never deal with it. So I have to learn to numb. I have to learn to deal with the pain. If I got a broken leg, Tommy, listen, I don't listen. Narcotics will help me for a little while. But I'm telling you something, until you get that bone back into alignment and get it back into the place that it can begin to heal, the pain will not leave. I have seen people that have broken their hips. And they go and put, I, I was a nurse for 15 years, you guys understand that. And I, I saw people break their hips and before we had to do surgery and all that. And I saw these, these people in, in severe pain. Their, their muscles would be so contracting. They were, the muscle, the body was trying to pull, the, the, pull, the, uh, uh, the, pull the, the bone back into place itself. They put them in traction and different things in order to stretch out that muscle, in order to, that thing that wouldn't contract and cause those spasms. But see, the spasms are there for a reason. There's something wrong that needs to be fixed. I'm the doctor today. And I brought my scalpel and my hammer. Oh, yeah, orthopedic surgery is ugly. <laughs> Screws, plates, hammers, saws. I mean, you think you was working in the wood shop. <laughs> Seriously. i got to remember. And, and the thing is, you, you, I want you to look back in your life. Not, 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 listen, we're, gonna look out of the, we're not looking out of an unredeemed lens. If you look out of an unredeemed lens, you'll get condemned right now. Don't you dare get condemned on that. I need you to look at your past through a redeemed lens, through the rose-collared, blood-stained glasses of, that Jesus put on your life, and look at your past through that lens. Are you today farther along? Or have you regressed? Are you still in love with, I say loving Jesus, in love with Jesus? Anybody can end up here. Anybody. Anybody. That's why I need you and you need me. That's why we need each other. You see somebody in this church you haven't saw for a while? Maybe somebody used to sit beside you? I need you to make a phone call. Well, listen, this church is doing great. I'm not saying this is great. You guys are great servers. Man, we got people that serve in this place like crazy. That's not what I'm trying to get across. I'm not saying we're doing bad. We're not doing bad. It's just a warning shot today. To remember, what, where were you at before? Can you remember a time that Jesus was all the time on your mind? And now he's not? We've got in a routine. Have we not? We get in a routine, don't we? And we take it for granted. We do it with our spouses all the time. We take it for granted. Remember. Amen. I want you to know something today. You say, well, where is the love of God? It's in your heart. Love not left you. It just needs to be stirred up. He says, remember. The second thing he says, remember therefore from where you've, where you've fallen. What's he, what's he say? What's the next thing? Repent. 
It's not a bad word. It's a good word. Repentance means this. It means to, to change your way of thinking from the previous way to the proper way. It means to change the mind that changes direction. I said changes the mind that changes your direction. I'm talking about you today getting a resolve in your heart and you confessing it to the Lord and saying, Jesus, I have left my first love. And today I stir up that love. Hey, listen, it's not like, it can, it's not like you have to go up here and you can bawl and, and cry. You, don't have to do, you, can, you can do that if you want to, but you don't have to beg God. All you got to do is make yourself and turn yourself back, back right to God. Get right back in His face. Amen. Repent. Confess. From where are you fallen? Confession is good. If you confess your sins, he's faithful and just to forgive. Confession is a good thing. It gets it out in the open. It brings light to this. And it holds you accountable. When you refuse to confess it, you don't hope you're saying, you know what, I refuse to expose it. And I'm refusing to deal with it. Repent. And the third and final thing is this. Repent and do the what? Do the first works. The third thing is redo. Redo. Start doing the first works. What were you doing before? When you were so passionately in love with Jesus, what was you doing before? What was you doing during that time? I'm going to go back to marriage a moment. Listen, marriages go in cycles. But every seven years, your feelings will start to leave. It's been known as uh, by the world, as you see people trying to go and step out on their spouses, they call it the seven-year itch. Well, what it is, see, they don't understand their commitments. They only operate by their feelings. What keeps your marriage strong is not your feelings. It's the commitment that you made before God, a pastor, and witnesses that keeps you. And if you, and maybe, it's, maybe that's why I'm going this way. If you today are driving your marriage on feelings, it's going to derail. Because your feelings will always lead you astray. It is supposed to be the caboose. And not the engine. Your love, your commitment. Love is not a feeling. Love is a commitment. I'm going to tell you one thing. The greatest act of love was Jesus Christ on a cross. Do you think that felt very good? I guarantee you. But it, it did not. But I guarantee you that was the greatest act and symbol of love. Was Jesus stretching out his arms and dying for all of us. But it didn't feel good. But if he stayed with it. I guarantee you the Bible says it was the joy that was set before him. I guarantee you what? When he got up out of the grave it felt awful good. Because his commitment drove him. Why are you saying this about, about your first works? Start doing what you were doing. I don't care if you don't feel like it. Start doing it. And what happens is when you start doing it, passion starts to return. You do what you've done. Do the first works. Do what you were doing before. What was you doing before? Well, you know what? I used to listen to, I used to listen to Christian music all the time. And now, you know what? I hardly ever listen to Christian music. Maybe just on a Sunday morning. I listen to more what Tim McGraw has to, whatever. I don't even know. Whoever. Whatever. I listen to more of that now than I did. To start doing what you were doing before. I'm not here to put law on anybody. I, that's not what I'm saying. I'm saying do the things that you were doing before. Maybe you'll just find something that you left. M maybe if you'll just go. Well, you know what? I used to listen to a lot of this guy preaching. I used to listen to him all the time. I used to have that on my house when I was cleaning the house. Then go back and do that. And maybe you'll find something that you, that you left. You know what, when I was really on fire for Jesus, you know what, I was serving big time in the church. And I was showing up every service. Then go and do the 
first works, maybe you'll find something that you, you left. Remember, repent, and then redo. If you'll heed what Jesus is saying, you'll find your first love. You'll find it. It's not hard to find. Just go back and start doing what you was doing before. Maybe you're in this room saying, you know what, I've never really been on fire for Jesus. I don't ever really remember a time that I... I don't know what I was doing. Then start doing something. And watch your life be transformed. I just don't want to love God. I want to be in love with God. And that's a, that's a different ball game. Amen? 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 It's time for you and I to overcome. Come on, Tam, let's play something. It's time for us to overcome some things. Why don't you stand to your feet this morning? I'm done. Hey, uh, will you find uh, Revelations 2 7 for me? He who has an ear to hear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To him who overcomes, I will give to eat from the tree of life, which is the midst of the paradise of God. What is Jesus saying? He just addressed it. We just read down for five scriptures. He said, I need you to have an ear to hear. He said, if you overcome, what does that mean overcoming what? Overcoming your flesh. Overcoming all the squirrels. Choosing to stay focused in on Jesus, dialing this thing down. Putting these where the peripheral vision is no longer. I'm, I'm going to get, it's, it's those uh, blinders that they put on horses. They want them to stay focused. It says, He who overcomes, He who conquers that stuff, you'll get to partake of the life of God, the Zoe. The life of God is not, eternal life is not about a, it's, it's not about quantity. It's about quality. I'm going to live forever. I get eternally. But Jesus said, I've come to give you life and life more abundantly. What's he saying? He said, I've come to give you my kind of life. I've come to offer to you and you can eat from the tree of life that you can partake of my divine nature that you can partake of the things that I have for you that you can partake from it if you'll overcome all the squirrels where are you at this morning this is what we're going to do this is your opportunity to respond up to you I'm not gauging this thing by whether you respond or not I believe I've done what God told me to do and I feel like I have and I'm, I'm leaving it now to you we're going to open up altars. And we're going to go and we're going to, if you want to come this morning in just a moment and you want to lay some things down, you want a new start, I want you to come. If you've been distracted and you've left your first, ain't nobody looking down on you. Nobody. Nobody's looking down on you. I want my heart right, don't you? I want myself geared in the right spot, don't you? Would you come this morning to the altar if you want to find a first, your first love again? You want to find first love? I want you to come. Would you come? I seen you, sir. I seen you. I seen you coming on Friday. I saw it in my heart. I knew you were coming. 